Hi guys, welcome to another one of RGDOLDAT lectures and today I'll be focusing specifically on KAP Unit 1 Module 3 and I'll be looking at the experiment for thermal conductivity. Now in this video I'll be addressing the experimental method to determine the thermal conductivity for a good conductor and that is using SEALS apparatus. And in a subsequent video I will be looking at the thermal conductivity uh, for a bad conductor using the LEES method. Okay, so before we get into the details of the experiment, let's talk a little bit about what thermal conductivity is. And before we do that, let's do a little bit of revision on conduction. So conduction is the flow of heat from a region of higher to lower temperature without the movement of the matter itself. And it uses two primary methods of lattice vibration and electron flow. Now when we talk about thermal conductivity, thermal conductivity is a property of the material and what it does is similar to resistivity when we looked at electricity, uh, thermal conductivity is a property that determines the rate at which heat will flow. So what you will find is that if you have a very good conductor, your thermal, thermal conductivity is larger than if you have a poor conductor. So here we're going to look firstly at the definition. And it is defined in terms of this equation. And we say that thermal conductivity is the rate of heat flow through a unit cross-sectional area per unit temperature gradient. And we use the equation Q over T is minus Ka delta theta over delta X. Now the Q on T tells you Q is energy, right? So it is the rate at which heat is flowing, right? So then now you have K representing your thermal conductivity, A represents the cross-sectional area, and delta theta over delta x represents the thickness. Now, that is your temperature gradient, right? Now, if you wanted to make K the subject, I use the modulus. Now, the negative sign here is just representative that heat flows from a region of higher to lower temperature. So, you are flowing from a higher to a lower temperature. Therefore, you have a negative gradient, and that is where the negative sign comes in. But in your calculation, you use the modulus. So, you don't have to include the negative sign in your calculation. All right, so let's go to using the seals apparatus. And if you look at my drawing, firstly, I'm going to explain it, all right? What is the setup? And then we look at the method. Now, you have a circular, or well, a cylindrical rod, I should say, that has a certain cross-sectional area, A. Now, one end, we're going to label that end P, you're going to place in a steam chest. And the steam chest, obviously, is to supply steam to heat it. The other end, Q, you're going to wrap a copper tubing and you're going to let water flow in that copper tubing. You're going to place two thermometers, T3 and T4, such that you are monitoring the temperature of the water, right? So you're looking at the temperature of the water. So this would represent here your inlet where water goes in and you're measuring the temperature here. And at this point, the water flows out. So this would represent your outlet temperature. And of course, at some distance, it's a pretty long rod. So at some distance L, you're going to, using mercury, you're going to embed two thermometers, liquid and glass, of course, and get the temperatures T1 and T2. Now, when you're using your steam chest, heat and P, it's going to be hotter, right, than Q. And you are going to allow heat energy to flow along the length of the rod. Now, the purpose of the apparatus at the point Q is to maintain a steady state condition. Now, a steady state condition is where the heat energy supplied by the steam chest is equal to the heat energy absorbed by the water. So, as your heat is being conducted along the rod, you will find that Q starts to get hot. Now, you do not want a state where P and Q are at the same temperature. Steady state is not where at the same temperature, but rather they have a constant temperature difference, right? So if you are looking at Q, 
right? You want you don't want Q to get so hot that it becomes the same temperature of P because then you will no longer facilitate the condition for heat transfer. So what happens at Q is that you want to have the water absorbing and getting rid of the heat that has been conducted along the rod. So obviously you have water flowing in at T3 and water flowing out at T4. So when that happens, you are maintaining a constant temperature difference between P and Q. And again, I'll emphasize that is where your condition of the heat being supplied via the steam chest at P is equal to the heat being uh, emitted or absorbed by the water at Q. Now, your at your steady state, you will have T1, T2, T3, and T4 having all different temperatures, but these temperatures are fixed or constant, and that is where steady state is achieved. So heat will flow until you will have that heat energy supplied being equal to heat energy absorbed. So it maintains a fixed temperature difference across each of the thermometers used. So what happens is that as steady state is achieved, you will use our formula to determine K. Now for that to take place, let's go back here to look at the variables that we needed. So if I want to get K, I need to get Q over T. I put the modular sign because you are not interested in its negative value. You just want the magnitude. You have to get the cross-sectional area. So if it's, it's again my cylindrical rod, I will know my area. I can measure it depending on the size of it using a vernier caliper, for example, the diameter. And normally you can get A is equal to pi D squared over so you could use your device like your vernier caliper to get the diameter depending on the size of it or your uh, screw gauge depending and you can determine A from that formula. Delta theta will be, we are considering here, this temperature difference across thermometers T1 and T2. And of course our change in thickness would be represented by L. Now, the problem is how do we get Q over T? And because of our initial steady state concept, we said that the heat supplied by the steam is equal to the heat absorbed by the water. So, if we look at our equation, we are saying that uh, mc delta theta over t, in a certain time, we have a mass of water. We, of course, know the specific heat capacity of water to be 4200 joules per kilogram per kelvin. And we have our change in temperatures. And this, of course, guys, is at the end Q because you are determining the heat energy absorbed. So, if you are, are saying that the heat energy absorbed by the water is equal to the heat energy supplied by the steam, then you can get Q over t. All right, so, and then we equate it because we would have had uh, A, right? We would have had delta theta and we would have had X. So, you can then substitute it to determine K. So, let's go back through the whole thing now. One end of the rod is placed in a steam chamber, P. The other end is encased by a copper tube with water flowing, Q. Two holes filled with mercury uh, to improve thermal conduct, contact, have placed thermometers T1 and T2 a distance L apart. So L would represent X basically. The whole apparatus is lagged, allow the steam chest to supply heat at the end P. Heat will flow to Q and the water will flow in through the copper tube at Q. And this occurs until a steady state is achieved where the heat supplied by the steam is equal to the heat absorbed by the water. All of the thermometers show a fixed but different temperatures. So Q over T is equal to MC delta theta over T. And delta theta will of course be T4 minus T3. Okay, and then we work down here to get K.